Alright, welcome to this advanced video regarding hydrogen bonding in biological or macromolecules. So, hydrogen bonds are incredibly critical in how many molecules work within living systems. So, the ability to form strong weak bonds and have them be replaced interchangeably at ease provides great utility when it comes to enzymatic um, action with binding of substrate to different receptors in the body for basically any protein structure, DNA structure, all of it deals when it comes with hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are what makes all those molecules work effectively and efficiently within inside our body. Problem is, a lot of students have difficulties identifying them. So this video is meant for you to see where hydrogen bonding could occur. Not necessarily where it will occur, but at least where it has the possibility to do so. Before we begin, we have these two molecules here. Before we start, I want to first give a background of what hydrogen bonds are. So hydrogen bonds are essentially a really strong dipole-dipole interaction that occurs when a hydrogen bond, or excuse me, a hydrogen, is covalently bonded to a very electronegative atom. So hydrogen bonds typically only occur when a hydrogen is bonded to a nitrogen a fluorine atom or an oxygen atom. Now there are some instances where electronegativity electro differences can be so great um, that they can actually form when hydrogen bonds to sulfur and when hydrogen bonds with chlorine. But typically the fun bonds are where hydrogen bonds typically occur and if you remember, fluorine typically doesn't occur in organic molecules, so we see it primarily in oxygen and nitrogen bonded to hydrogens. So, again, let's go back to some old chemistry. Fluorine typically only forms one bond. So, when fluorine bonds to hydrogen, that's what we have. Nitrogen typically forms three bonds. We see it primarily with nitrogen bonded to uh, some larger structure with two or less hydrogens. And then we also see oxygen bonded to hydrogen. And typically it forms two bonds, one with a larger structure and one to a hydrogen. So again, we typically see one fluorine bond, three bonds with nitrogen, and two bonds with oxygen. Now also, remember that every bond is a sharing of a pair of electrons. So in this case, this bond is two electrons. These three bonds deal with three electrons. And these two bonds at the bottom deal with four total electrons. And we always are trying to complete an octet, or a pairing of eight total electrons in the valence shell of each of these three electronegative atoms. So those leftover electrons orbit around each of these atoms in what's known as lone pairs. So typically they're done with these little balloon structures. And oxygen has two of its own. So if you can see, we have four lone pair electrons, two lone pair electrons, and six lone pair electrons. So in this case, we have two plus six equals eight, two plus six equals eight, and four plus four equals eight. So what happens is when a hydrogen is bonded to an electronegative atom, that element 
wants to draw the electrons more towards the electronegative element and leave hydrogen all alone. So what's going to happen in, let's say, an oxygen bond, all the electrons are going to want to go towards the oxygen and it's going to leave the hydrogen partially positive. So we denote it with a delta sign. That's going to leave this with a slight negative. This is where the dipole comes in. We have di meaning two, two poles, one slightly negative, one slightly positive. And these slight negatives, slight positives, are what cause the stronger, weak intermolecular forces among molecules. So in order to spot these, we want to first look for nitrogens, oxygens, or fluorines, again just nitrogens and oxygens in macromolecules, biological macromolecules, and try and find where they are bonded to hydrogens. So right here in this molecule we have adenosine, or excuse me, adenine, and when it comes to this molecule it's very important for biological function because it is a main component of um, adenosine for the base in DNA and also for ATP and ADP for electron transport and energy transfer. So if we see we have nitrogens that instantly should clue us that there is possible hydrogen bonding that can occur. So if you see here, we have one, two, three bonds connected to this nitrogen. Notice none of them are hydrogens, but it does have a lone pair of electrons floating around the outside, because each line represents a bond, one, two, three bonds, times two electrons per bond gives us six. That means we must have two floating around here. So around this nitrogen as well, we also have a lone pair coming off, and we have this hydrogen. Here we have one, two, three bonds, each having two, total six electrons, so we have another lone pair. It's pretty much safe to assume that as long as this nitrogen isn't protonated with a positive charge, there are going to be lone pairs coming off of it at some point. In this case, same for this as well. So if we're going to try and count the number of hydrogen bonds, we look first at lone pairs and number of hydrogens bonded. So here we have one lone pair. That means we can have one hydrogen bond form. That means if a hydrogen of another bonded to another electronegative element and some other molecule comes close, the hydrogen is going to come up to the slightly negative side of this molecule and it's going to form a hydrogen bond. Here with this molecule, or excuse me, this nitrogen bonded to the hydrogen, this is a slight positive. So if a slight negative charge, a lone pair of one of those electronegative atoms comes up, it's going to form a hydrogen bond. Just like if a hydrogen from some electronegative atom comes over here, it's going to attract, forming a hydrogen bond. So here we have one H bond two H bonds. Here we have one H bond, because just the one lone pair, there's no hydrogens, one H bond. And here we have two hydrogens, again each can form a hydrogen bond, and this lone pair, so this can form three. So in theory, this adenine molecule can form two, three, six, seven, eight total hydrogen bonds. Now that takes into account proper conformation, whether it's oriented right in space with other molecules around it, as long as there's nothing else sterically or blocking it based on its shape, it can form a maximum of eight hydrogen bonds. Looking over here, this is deoxyribose. This applies the oxygens. So here we have a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen which is bonded to a carbon. There are two understood lone pairs on this because there's only two bonds on the oxygen. It means the other four unaccounted for electrons are floating around as lone pairs. 
and here we have this hydrogen. So if you look, we're going to have a slight negative, slight negative, slight positive. So we can form three H bonds here. Typically, you can form three hydrogen bonds anywhere you see an OH group. So we have another OH group here. Again, these lone pairs contribute to the partial negative. Hydrogen contributes to the partial positive. So again, another three H bonds. It's called deoxyribose because there's no oxygen here on this arm. This whole picture is called a Hawthorne projection. It's trying to show it to you in a 3D structure. So another OH. We don't have to go through that anymore. 3H bonds. And then this ether bond over here, we have again two bonds. There's no hydrogens bonded to it, but we do know there's two understood lone pairs. So this can form a total of two H bonds. So in theory, this deoxyribose can form three, six, nine, eleven total H bonds. So I apologize for the clutter. This is just meant to enforce that hydrogen bonds are a special kind of dipole-dipole interactions when hydrogen is electro is covalently bonded to an electronegative atom, primarily nitrogen and oxygen. And when you have that buildup of the partial positive and partial negative, the two can come together to form a strong, weak intermolecular force stronger than all the other types. And spotting it with inside these biological macromolecules is really important to understand how these molecules interact with other structures within inside the body. So I apologize, this video went way longer than I meant to, and there's a lot more on this screen, but this is a very useful skill when it comes to understanding biochemistry, biology, anatomy and physiology, especially cellular signaling, um, and organic chemistry. So I hope you find it helpful.